We're back. Another episode. Welcome back. C-Suite Unfiltered with Mike Andy. How's it going? Good. good, good, man. Good. Love to hear it. Well, we're going to jump straight in. Can so it? I mentioned my not financial advice last week was to tune in next week. Oh, okay. Because we we're going to continue the conversation on taxes. Oh, okay. And based on a video that I watched, uh, an interview that Simon Sinek or a podcast that Simon Sinek did with Scott Galloway. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, the title of the podcast is The War on the Youth with Professor Scott Galloway. So that's kind of the, the beginning of it. And that might be a turnoff for some people. Very interesting listen. I recommend listening to the whole thing. But the second half of the podcast is interesting. They talk about, and let me get the the title exactly right here, moral capitalism and political extremes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that conversation revolves around actual taxes and some of the stuff we were alluding to last week. So I'll jump in with a couple of quotes here from Simon Sinek. And one of the things that they are talking about uh, throughout this pod is the loss of idealism. So we're going to talk some, you know, some haughty language here. I know it's your favorite, (laughs) but I would love to know your thoughts on uh, the loss of idealism. And what Simon Sinek says is that nowadays we have all this divide in America and a lot of divide between the rich and the poor. And like, you should be paying more taxes. I should be paying less social programs, whatever it may be. Simon Sinek talks about the loss of idealism, and he said talking about world peace was common historically. If you look at presidential speeches from JFK, from Ronald Reagan, whichever side of the aisle you were on, from 1900s America up till, he basically says it kind of gets lost in like the 80s and 90s, uh, especially with the dot-com boom and, and the advancements in tech. But what are your thoughts on that? Has America or society as a whole lost elements of idealism? Because I can't even think of the last time I heard world peace. Someone talk about world peace. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I don't think the, (laughs) I don't think the ingredients of idealism are required to have the outcome, right? Like, I don't think we need to be all talking about it in order for it to happen necessarily. Um, And for it to be like our, like, like you can have world peace and no one be talking about it. Mm -hmm. And usually in times of peace is actually when no one is talking about Fair. it because it's not top of mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think like it, there will always be bad actors. There will always be f- political and religious fractions that create wars and strife between mm-hmm. people, unfortunately. And unfortunately, we will not be uh, man and women enough to actually just like talk things through. We will throw bombs at each other and mm. do all sorts of malicious things. Um, but you know, this is out of my sphere. Idealism. Okay, good. Like positivity. (laughs) I don't know. Like, um, it's just a matter of like, I don't think things to be top need to be talked about a lot in order for the outcome to happen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when the outcome is happening, you don't talk about it very often. Mm -hmm. Right. So like when leads are pouring in, no one's talking about marketing. (laughs) Yeah. Fair. fair. And when when we have tons of people that are lining up to be hired, we're not talking about like, how do you find employees? Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's just like, it's, it's not top of mind. Uh, many times because it's happening. Mm -hmm. And and historically, even with everything that's going on, we are, from a relative standpoint, if you look back compared to 500 or 1,000 years ago, relatively peaceful. Mm -hmm. So, anyways. Yeah, and World Peace, he's using it more as an example. He's not saying, like, that is the end-all, be-all of idealism. What he's getting at is that there's been this loss of idealism. And that now, especially because, you know, from what Simon Sinek does, is that he is, you know, a a public speaker. He's a consultant to businesses. He's a coach. He's a motivator, however you want to classify him. And what the conversation that him and Scott are having is that... Basically, American politics have gone too far. They don't care enough about the the individual, uh, the individual citizen that actually has put those representatives in place and the laws that they are signing into into place, as well as these corporations um, are mistreating employees. So that's kind of the conversation as well. It's like American politics and those that represent the American people have lost their way, and American corporations just steamroll their employees, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Scott is one of the big proponents, one of the big big votes local voices right now of raising federal minimum wage. Uh, He believes it should be across the board, $25 an hour. We can unpack that (laughs) differently. But Simon Sinek's just using world peace as an example of idealism. And he feels that because America's lost its way, because corporations have lost their way, there, there needs to be a shift back to idealism that... I can, Mike Andes, and I feel like you do actually hold the elements of idealism that you want to change the level of professionalism in the lawn care and landscape industry. You also want to compensate your employees well. That's pretty ideal, right? You're not saying like, I want to um, take all these other corporations out of business. I want to directly compete with Grounds Guys, Brightview, whoever it is. You're like, hey, I want to raise the level of professionalism in this industry. Ideally, 
that floats all boats, right? Mm -hmm. A rising tide floats all boats. And ideally, if I can do that, I can pay my team premium wages, give them benefits, things of that nature. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I just don't think about that stuff, yeah, dude. No, totally. I'm just like, look, I need to make money and I want my owners at Augusta Nation to make money and I want yeah. industry people in the industry make more money and you know, will X, Y, and Z make <laughs> them more money? And yes, like they can use that money to whatever extent they will get more satisfaction out of life, whether it be yeah. <laughs> spending on their kids or growing the business or whatever. And so I just focus on that stuff, whether or not it's idealistic or not, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think <laughs> humans are idealistic in general because we're always striving to make our, our, our current circumstances better. Mm -hmm. Like if you throw someone in the, in the middle of the, the desert, the first thing they're looking for is like water, shelter, like they're idealistic immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so I think it's inherently baked into us. And that's what like uh, from evolution, from a perspective of technology and us just becoming more civilized generally happens with time. Because mm -hmm. like if I can make the landscape industry better, great. And if someone else can make like banking better, great. And if someone else can make like paint on the walls better, like yeah, if we yeah. all do that, eventually you have, you know, you know, idealistic thought of like becoming a better society. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's kind of the, the frame, uh, the framework that they're talking about. It's like this loss of idealism that then shifts into, uh, moral obligations, not only of the individual, but also of corporations. Yeah. Um, and Simon Sinek has this quote. He said in the 19th century, the British and American wealthy gave massive amounts to charity, building universities and hospitals, not out of tax obligations. So where do you think that shift has happened? Uh, he said he did a lot of research into this. You look at, you know, the Carnegie's, the Vanderbilt's and then prestigious universities universities and hospitals in England, in the UK, he said it was very consistent. That these were all donations. And they say it was a commonality of man that every man has the experience of life and death and they want to give back. Now they weren't obligated to do that. They didn't do it for tax reasons. They did it to give back to their communities, whether you believe that or not. What are your thoughts on that versus now? Now you have to really kind of hold the rich people over a barrel to get money out of them, if you will. Yeah. Like there's, there's, as soon as you incentivize something, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. And so it's the same thing with like asking for a review from a customer, for example. I believe that people do that because the intrinsic value they get in proving to everyone else around them that sees that review that they are correct. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is actually the epitome of what a review is mm -hmm. about. Um, and telling other people, basically, I made the right decision, go use this service. Right. Now, as soon as you incentivize that and say, I'm gonna give you a $50 gift card, now it immediately strips that away. And now it's about the incentive. And so if you're going to incentivize something like donations or philanthropy or charity, now it switches from the inherent goodness of the benefit I get receive emotionally by giving money, and it switches to now tax incentives. Mm -hmm. And so the problem with, no, the problem, what has happened with the tax code is because there's now incentives for everything that the government wants and needs to happen, like affordable housing, creating jobs, creating more mm -hmm. uh, 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 places to live. Like all of these things are incentives that they have created. But now instead of doing it out of the goodness of your heart, there is an incentive. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we, we go after it for the incentive sake. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's like discretionary effort with employees. It's like, yes, you can, you can pay people $50 more if they do this and a hundred dollars more if they do that. And then tell them, Hey, if you do this, you'll get a bonus. Or you can just be like, Hey, go hire, go hire thoroughbreds. They're just going to go crush it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, discretionary effort is released. And then you just give them more money as it happens. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only is right or wrong. It's just a matter of like, do you want to have that kind of carrot before the horse? Or do you want to have the, like, go run for it and then get intrinsic value because of, accomplishing things. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing is true when it comes to philanthropy. It's like, do I want the inherent feeling of giving that I actually receive value from or the incentive? And as soon as you put the incentive in place, I think people default to that. Mm -hmm. And everyone that wants to give for the sake of philanthropy and for the sake of what it makes them feel is going to be lumped into the bucket of, oh, they're doing it for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's why like, I don't talk about it because right. it's like, if, if I'm giving for this reason, I will be lumped into the fact that you're doing it for tax purposes. Right. And so I try to keep it like I am doing this for tax purposes or I'm doing this for charity in my brain. And then I just don't talk about any of them mm -hmm. because, um, otherwise it'll be misconstrued. It's like everything, everything I do that is good is because of the incentive. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe that's true. Um, but I think that as soon as you add the incentive, it takes away from the benefit. Like when I get a tax return, a tax a receipt from a charity. Um, it, it almost takes away from like, oh, well, yeah, like I did that. I was doing this to be kind. Like I got this warm, fuzzy feeling when I gave that right. check and now like <laughs> I'm getting something back in return. Yeah. Well, now it's gone. Yeah. And I think the, the, the most, uh, most, 
uh, one of the most satisfying things is to be able to give with no ability for them to return back. Mm-hmm. And so like, that's when you give mm-hmm. money to like a, a, a poor person or to someone that's begging, for example. Like, they will never give you that money back. Mm-hmm. You will never see a return or an ROI for that mm-hmm. money. And that's the inherent benefit that you get is that feeling. Mm-hmm. And so if immediately when you turn the corner, there was someone else that was going to give you $50 because you gave them 20 or give you 10 back, like you get 50% mm-hmm. off of what do you get the beggar? There's like this feeling like, well, I just got that feeling stripped away from me. Right. So anyways. Yeah, no, it, it's a good way to look at it. And I don't necessarily want to get on a, a, a deep dive of giving, but that ultimately is kind of the the balance that Simon and, and Scott are trying to talk about in this conversation is that there is a moral obligation to uh, support those around you in in theory, in this in the context of this conversation. However, when you bring taxes into play, well, now it's not a moral obligation. It's a moral responsibility. Well, it's not even a moral. It's just a responsibility. Is it, it is a requirement by the land in which you live? And that's what they're getting at is how do we find that balance? How do we get back to that balance to give back to our, our communities, to our employees, to those who uh, we live next to our neighbors, if you will. So Scott has something here. I'll show you this clip. Uh, I'll put it in so you can get the full context. I thought about reading it, but he's just uh, much, much more articulate than I could be even reading his own words so yeah it's one thing i always think about is like giving without the expectation of return is like the purest form of love Mm -hmm. like you know you give something to someone typically you're doing it to foster the relationship and get return from Mm -hmm. it but like giving without any chance that you will get return from it is like the purest form of love Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think on that note, that's part of why donating time is so important. Yeah. Right? If you can't donate money, you can't no one can ever give you back time. So whether it's just supporting, you know, a local children's sports league, yeah. you're donating your time to those kids to show them, you know, uh, a, to be a good role model, to teach them uh you know, how to hard, how to work hard and how to win and how to lose. Or it could be all the way up to, you know, doing mission trips or going, uh, you know, moving across the country or whatever it is to go serve people. Giving, giving your time is so important and so valuable as well. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So this is what Scott says here in this conversation about taxes and moral obligations. We need long-term solutions. Let me give you one very tactical idea. If we could go back in time, would we put a pretty immense tax on all carbon capture, all carbon emission, and all oil pulled out of the ground. We knew that pulling fossil fuels out of the ground and then arbing it into a substance to create economic value was gonna have a lot of externalities. So if we'd said, for every barrel we pull out, we're putting a $10 tax on it, and we're gonna start investing in forward-leaning investments around the government, job training, and, and renewables. This is, we're at that moment. The new energy, seven of the 10 most valuable firms in 1980 were energy companies, seven of the 10 most valuable firms in 2024 are tech companies, but they're not, they're energy firms. They're all becoming the same firm offering something called compute. Instead of powering our cars and our factories, they're powering our phones and our LLMs. Which requires right a lot now, of power. Right now, <laughs> a query on ChatGPT takes 10 times the energy of Google. Right now, is this an opportunity to put in place legislation and have forward-leaning and forward-thinking politicians who get enough support and say, okay, we're gonna tax compute. We're gonna tax compute because we know there are going to be externalities that will require money around misinformation, around teen depression, everything around you're paying saying, out the deficit. Everything you're saying is correct. Let's go straight into, we don't have to go into the specifics of it, yeah. but I wanna look at the, the kind of black and white. Scott Galloway says that tech companies are now the energy companies of the 80s. Yeah. And they should we should be preemptive with our taxing of them because we understand how or we don't understand how much compute power and energy they're going to need in the future, so we need to preemptively plan for that. What are your thoughts on that tax? I think taxes are bad in general, so like <laughs> <laughs> um there's just misuse funds. Like the reason that the tech firms are able to now tap into compute and use this energy is because of the cheaper resource of energy. Mm -hmm. And so if I would have taxed the fuel, guess what would have happened? Those resources would have been extracted from elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And guess where that power now would be computing from? Those countries. And so whenever tax, unless you were able somehow to do a global tax, mm-hmm. like, and then, then everything that comes out of the earth, like we are going to tax it. Well, then you just get a black market for oil do- drilling. Right. So there's just a matter of like, as soon as you start throwing these artificial, like, well, if this happens, we'll do this. It's like, whoa, whoa, okay, well, then what about the other thousand ways to get around that? Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I do believe that that would be the right short-term measure. 
I also believe that these companies have enough money that they would then just start to work outside of the country mm. to avoid said tax. And they would set up the data centers instead of in Arizona and Nevada. They would just set them up in Europe. They would set them up in Africa. They'd set them up in Mexico to avoid the tax. Mm -hmm. So creating like small little like dams in a river does not is not going to prevent the flow of the water. The water's gonna get downstream. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's more a matter of uh, of channeling this in a, in a more constructive manner, not damming the river with taxes. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you put a tax, it's the opposite of an incentive, right? So it's right. like, okay, if you do this, you will not be penalized. Okay, well, let's not do that. Oh, so like we're not going to pull oil from the ground. Oh, we're not going to create like the best tech companies in the world from the United States. The United States, one of the biggest advantages we have is that these tech firms control the world. Mm -hmm. And one of our best geopolitical like advantages is the fact that every country bar like Russia and China rely on the core services that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. And so you lose that because you're like, Oh, we're going to tax them. And they're just going to bounce. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, but like 30 to 50% of the revenues from these tech firms come from international sources. So they could bounce. And so if you make it so adversarial and you're so against them, they're just going to leave. The same way that if you would have done that to oil companies, they would have left too. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, oh, we'll just keep mining, you know, drilling in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And we'll ship it over here. It'll be cheaper. And so if we didn't have the, the cheaper energy, that wouldn't set up the compute. And if we don't have the compute, it's probably going to lead to something down the road that if we tax that so heavily and it bounces, that we lose out on AI, robotics, and things that come down the road. And so I'd just be careful about it. I do believe that there's a monopolies. I do believe that there's way too much power being given to the tech the firms because like you can't compete with them in certain mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. And if they, you do compete with them, they just create the thing, bundle it up with their like subscription package and they just wipe you out. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to compete with them. I do think that it was, it was like, uh, unbridled power given to them. I think that in any new technology, there's going to be unbridled power. The same way that seven out of the 10 companies, like you said, were energy companies that extracted oil you know, in the previous century. I, yes, this century will probably be tech firms. But if we, if we just demolish them, just like, okay, well, then we're just gonna crush you mm -hmm. to the smithereens. If you sold the top four or five companies completely, it would put a small dent in the US debt. So like, why not curb the debt spending mm -hmm. instead of focusing on like, well, we could literally liquidate these companies and it would put a small dink, like a little chink in the debt of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, that was a long tyrant. Yeah. So why would you be opposed to get, get to the basics? Um, simplify it for me, if you will. Let's, let's dumb it down. I'm no economist. But what he is saying is by increasing taxes or regulations on them, not stopping their growth, not stopping the advancements of technology. But you but do as soon as you put incentives in place. Yeah, but increasing those taxes and essential, essentially regulations on them, will that not help benefit the American economy and create better social programs and also help reduce the, the U.S. national debt? Yeah, in the short term. That's what I'm saying. In the yeah. short term, this is a great solution. So why, why doesn't that work in the long term? Because long term, that. you'll just get around the tax. Right. You'll go to a different yeah. country. <laughs> You're like, okay, great. You don't want to see we're going to go headquarters someplace else. Mm -hmm. And you've seen it with like Tesla and SpaceX and like companies like, oh, you don't like us here? Oh, you're going to impose a new tax? Cool, cool, we'll bounce. And in six months, they're out. Yeah. And if you do that, these companies will leave the United States. Mm -hmm. And everyone that thinks that like, the United States will keep these companies forever is delusional mm -hmm. because it's not hard to incorporate in other countries. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult. You just have to convince your talent force to move there. And if you have a large enough company, you say, okay, great, we're just going to go build a town. And they're going to give us free taxes for the next 10 years mm -hmm. if we come build the town, move our entire workforce. Oh, and by the way, the weather's great. Yeah. So you know what? We're going to pay everyone the same amount in an economy where it's a third of the cost of living. And for $100,000, you can buy a really nice house. We're still going to pay your same wages if you move over to here. Like, I happen to believe that that would work out. Mm -hmm. The same way that companies have moved from like Texas, from California, Texas, and to Tennessee, et cetera. And like their labor force does move with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point. I think the, the, once again, the greater context, and that's why I started this conversation is they're, they're, they are having an idealistic conversation. Like Scott is not anti-tech. He's not anti-progress in right. that regard. He is pro the American citizen that needs social programs over the importance of corporate profit. Yeah. And that's where Scott, he admittedly says in this podcast and many others, like he, he is far left. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's important that, you know, folks like yourself is and he not I, moderate? he's more moderate, isn't he? No, he, he classifies himself as far left in the traditional sense, oh. not in the extremist sense. Got it, got it. And that's part of the conversation they have. Okay. He <laughs> says that political extremism is also part of the reasons it's yeah, hurting America yeah. equally on the left and the right. Yeah. But he's like, 
like ide- ideologically he is far left. Right. But in modern American politics, he is a moderate, right, right, a moderate right. Democrat. Got it. Uh, but he's a lifelong Democrat. Anyways, he is talking about the fact that corporate profits are at an all-time high. These tech companies are booming. There's little to no regulation around them. They have all these different ways around this outdated tax policy right now around tech, like energy companies in the 70s and 80s. Why can't we idealistically impose taxes on them to not only um, not say we are prioritizing corporate profit, but also create social programs or benefits to the American citizen? Yeah, so you, this is treating the symptom, right? So like, I agree, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's a matter of, okay, so let's say we tax these companies. Over the next 15 years, they all start to move out. They start to diversify. The $100 billion of extra tax that we will get from them because we really crack down. And let's just also realize that they have armies of yeah. tax accounts <laughs> that will get around all these, th- yeah, these things yeah. anyways. But like, let's just assume that the tax actually hits them and we get $100 billion. That is a small, tiny drop in the bucket to what our debt is. And honestly, what the bigger problem here is that we are now bound to these companies and we can't do anything about it because, and and we can't impose taxes and get them out of the country or whatever because we have so much debt. Mm -hmm. Like if we didn't have any debt, this is a totally different conversation, Mm -hmm. right? Because for example, let's say we get a hundred billion. Let's say we get $200 billion of extra tax revenue from these companies, which like look at their corporate tax rates and like what they're actually paying. This would be like a massive spike. Mm -hmm. Let's say we get $200 billion of extra tax revenue from them and let's assume they don't move, okay? Um, I genuinely believe that the benefit from a geopolitical standpoint of having this kind of monopoly on technology in the United States is worth more than that because we spend hundreds of billions of dollars on defense and all the elements of paying off countries and giving $100 billion to Ukraine and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. I believe that the like the fact that the entire Ukraine war is being ran off of Starlink right now and Starlink happens to be in the United States is a huge geopolitical political, like geopolitical advantage. Yeah. And so just be careful with getting like pushing those people away. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that we should cozy up to them. I'm not saying I'm just saying we we've we've, const- we've created this very uh, weird position because we can't get rid of them because we have this debt. Mm-hmm. The debt is the problem. The spending is the problem. Mm-hmm. It's like yes, we want more tax revenue. Great. And how's it going to be spent? Oh, we're going to ship 100 of it over and do ammunitions to a war that we have absolutely no impact on our lives. Yeah. So like that's where it's like. Is, do we have a, it's like when I talk about, do we have a leads problem or do we have a follow-up problem? Yeah, like, yeah, do we yeah. have a, a tax revenue problem or do we have a spending problem? Because mm-hmm. if the spending was curbed and our tax and our, we, our debt and our def, de- deficits weren't as great, we would have a lot more leverage with these companies to talk about taxes mm-hmm. and regulation. But we can't because if we lose them, we're toast. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting the, the way you, you talk about this because they... They are having this conversation um, that stems from, you know, Simon Sinek's background is helping business owners and, and CEOs and corporations. And Scott Galloway is more of an economist, a, com- a commentator, if you will. And Scott is essentially saying, um, to, to your point, he's essentially saying, the power of the United States rests with the voter. So if we need to make these changes, if we have a spending problem, the voter, the collective voter needs to make that change. And what Simon is saying, and this is honestly an interesting concept, what Simon is saying that it's actually, it's the worker, it's the employee who can impact the way in which their corporations are running that will then benefit the the voter, right? The employee is the voter. They're kind of talking about them from different sides of of an analogy. Mm -hmm. Scott is like, their their most powerful position is as a voter. They can go and every November vote on in on policies and on decisions and on representatives and simon is saying but they have the power inside of their companies to then drive change in policy and in government yeah but <laughs> dude, humans are we're just too we're just too wired for the short term like that's right. why like voting is the solution here no one will vote to get rid of social security like you can solve things really fast. No one will do that. Yeah. All the voters. Which Scott is pro. I, I agree. I know. Yeah. I know. And I think that we'll see a shift over the next like thirty years. But by then, our debt will be so out of spiral. We'll just, we'll just like the debt will be nuts. Yeah. Um, but you, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say you can't get rid of social security until the majority of boomers are gone. Right. Which like sounds horrible. My parents are boomers. I want them to live yeah. forever. <laughs> like, I, but but like I know like my dad's very conservative. Like he's completely against that. He's like, no, I paid into it for 50, 60 years. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's his, he should get his cut. Yeah. And, and I agree with that. But in 20 years, when he's, <laughs> he's 
these <laughs> no that's right let's yeah. give them 50 more years <laughs> yeah when that happens then the next group is like well i've paid into it for the last 30 40 50 years exactly and so like exactly. we'll never be able to get off that drip yeah and so the same thing is true in my opinion from an employee's perspective yes in theory the voter is in control mm -hmm. in theory the employee is in control but is the employee willing to walk away from their job because right. that company doesn't is trying to get around taxes mm -hmm. or because they are supporting something that they're not willing to and if they are now does it actually put their cause at loss because now they're economically uh disadvantaged compared to everyone that stayed with the company mm -hmm. and so also most employees would rather have an increase in pay today instead of the the potential of 5 10 15 20 years down mm -hmm. the road having some sort of return most team members and i know this because we did a, a poll yeah. of like do you want more money today or do you want more money in the future and literally 98 percent, 97 percent of people said we want more money today yeah so the same thing is true both of the voter and employee i agree that is the decision maker everyone is too short-term focused um, mm -hmm. And we just wired all as humans like, like that. Because if I was 60 and I'd been paying into Social Security and probably put like hundreds of thousands of dollars in, I'd also be like, forget that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't want to lose back. that. Totally. Um, so it makes sense. But uh, that's what happens when you steal from tomorrow and bring it forward to today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the problem with debt is you are robbing from tomorrow the expectation of having to pay interest and principal payments for the what you can live on today. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that in this country. We do it in our in our personal lives. We do it from team members. It's like, I'll just like make them work 90 hours this week and then they'll crash and burn, all burn through someone else. Like, mm -hmm. yes, that will work in the short term. It will not work in the long term. Yeah. So it's just like, there's always that fine balance. Cool ring, by the way, dude. It's really oh, thin. Just a, just a rubber Let's go. black ring. Mm -hmm. I like it a lot. I it's play like with elastic. it too much. I know, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, they also talk about CEOs and that CEOs sometimes are um, ideologues. They're ideologists, right? They think, okay, I have this grand idea and I'm going to build this really cool thing and it's great. And they're bright eyed and bushy tailed, if you will. And then what they say is then money comes into play. And it effectively corrupts most CEOs, right? And Simon, founders or CEOs, um, CEOs. So okay. yeah, maybe not founders. They're, they they don't like specifically define who yeah. they're talking about when they okay. say CEOs or founders. I agree that there could be a differentiation there, and I understand. I, I can I can see where you're going with that, but they're basically saying, uh, and and they use Sam Altman as an example. Yeah. That like Scott Galloway says, um, Sam Altman can sit there and look at the camera and talk in hushed tones about the dangers <laughs> of AI for your teenager. <laughs> But at the end of the day, he just wants to make a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Scott can be a little bit of a, of a, just, he always looks at the negative a yeah, lot of times. Yeah. But they're saying that a lot of times these CEOs have ideals. They, they think that, like, their ideas are great and that they want to build these beautiful companies and have all these employees and everyone's going to be happy. And then money comes into play and that corrupts them. What are your thoughts on that as, as a CEO of multiple companies? It, well, it's, I, I do really do believe CEO and founder are very different. Yes. Because like a CEO is an employee of the shareholders. Mm -hmm. A founder can kind of do whatever they want if they hold full equity. And so, you know... Which um, you are both hats. Yeah, so both. the the CEO is an employee and has incentives to do certain things. And they will follow those incentives. Like if it's growth earnings per share, if it is growth of revenue, they will follow the incentives. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I, I just believe that incentives drive everything. Like I think Charlie Munger says, like, show me the incentive. I'll show you um, the action or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like basically incentives drive everything. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like if, you, if you're going to give a, a CEO more money based on the earnings per share, they will make sacrifices on all fronts to make sure that the earnings per share goes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that they say that fiduciary duty is less than moral duty. And that is why Scott is so adamant um, about being a little bit more aggressive towards corporations when it comes to taxes and the way in which they support the American economy and the American citizen because they are putting their fiduciary responsibility over moral responsibility. What are your thoughts on that? Follow the incentives. Like, they're, if you, okay, I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but then I just play out what happens if you do that. Yeah. Like, so we're going to take the, the smartest people in the world, put them in a box guess what? They're going to figure out a way to get around it. Yeah. And so like, we're, we're going to make $25 per hour minimum wage. Great. And they're going to figure out how to create robotics to where they need no labors. Mm -hmm. And who's that going to hurt? The lower class. The mm -hmm. people that have the low paying jobs will no longer have a job. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, by doing the $25 per hour, you have massive inflation, which also impacts the, the poor the most. Mm -hmm. Like no one, no one rich has been impacted by inflation. 
if your net worth is over $20 million, you are not, have not been impacted by the past four years. Yeah. You're like, oh, my lawn care went up? Who cares? Yeah. Oh, oh like, it's going to cost Insurance a little more for up. gas? Like, whoop de do. Like, yeah. oh, pardon me. My million dollars just became $2 million in my cost of living. Okay. I have 20. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it, but, but you take what happens at the grocery store, that is a huge thing for lower middle class and low class individuals. It just mm-hmm. is. Like you're going up 25%, the grocery stores, the difference between them eating and not is the difference between being able to eat out once a month versus nothing at all mm-hmm. and having soup at home. And so uh, the impact of inflation is massively towards the, the lower classes. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, that's, what, that's what putting people in a box will do. It creates weird things that happen in the economy. Mm-hmm. Okay, for example, COVID. Let's shut everyone down. Look what's happened the past four years in the economy. All because we artificially put these massive mm-hmm. locks in place. And there's been more COVID in the office in the past six months <laughs> than in 2020. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, well, good on that bad. I thought, that I went the other day, I was like, I looked up COVID case count. Yeah. I'm like, for sure there's got to be a spike. Yeah. Like, there, yeah. everyone's dropping like flies over here. And there's <laughs> nothing. I'm like, this is such garbage. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. We got no, way off No, you're tangent. good. You're good. Yeah. It, I, I think Scott's argument, though, and this is, this is, kind of zooming in on now on the $25 an hour increase. Yep. This is this is verbatim what he said. Uh, he said that if, well, not verbatim, but I'm directly quoting, if you will. He said, if you raise $25 or minimum wage to $25 an hour, mm-hmm. corporate profits will go down. Guess what? They're on an all-time high. They won't go down. Okay, or stock prices, excuse me, You're stock take- prices. Hold on. He says stock prices will go down on corporates or corporations. In, stock the sh- price. in the short term. In the short term. Like two, yeah. three months. And then he says, but you will stimulate the economy because what are, this, this is his words, what are poor people really good at? Spending their money. So he feel like his argument is that if oh, you put- Increase the velocity of money. If you, exactly. If you put more hands in the lower working class types that are taking minimum wage jobs, you're actually going to increase the velocity of the of spend and of the economy. Yeah, but what he doesn't take into account is the fact that now your P&L is going to have, instead of 40% labor, it's going to be 60% mm-hmm. because your cost went from 18 bucks an hour to 25 artificially. Mm-hmm. So what do you do as an, as an executive to make sure you don't have less earnings per share because that's what you're getting incentivized on? Right. You cut labor. Mm -hmm. And how do you cut labor? You go get robots. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, guess who's going to, you're like, oh, that'd be great. It'll create more jobs. Yeah, you're right. For who? Robotic engineers Mm -hmm. and coders and the tech firms that you're trying to penalize. Mm -hmm. And all that compute power, guess what it's going to have to be working on? The robots. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to move the money up in a different way. And that's is like, there not a, a, this would be maybe I'm, you know, I'm trying to argue as Scott, yeah. which I can't be, uh, I can't, he's just, Dude, he probably knows, you know, not probably, he knows 10 times more than me. I'll say that he probably has looked at this way better than me. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, you know, no, you're good. Small business over here. Just. But the, the thought is, would it, is it, isn't it obvious that there is a labor problem and there will continue to be a labor problem. So bringing in more robotics, more automation isn't a negative thing. And we should be paying the actual human labor that is showing up. Yeah, until we don't need wage. them. Like what happens when you replace every low or er, er, low wage earning work, worker that doesn't have skills. They have no job. Mm-hmm. This is when universal basic income actually becomes a plausible thing because they, they are unemployable. Mm-hmm. Because their jobs are replaced by robotics and they do not have the skills to train said robotics. Mm -hmm. Because those are the software engineers that we're trying to penalize over at NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. But they're the ones making all the money. Mm -hmm. And so the same way that we like, we're going to give $1,200 to every single person because everyone's had these trouble. Guess where all the money went to? All these corporations. Mm -hmm. So when we try to help people, it's by giving them money. It's never a solution. Like just giving the low wage earner more money is not the solution. Cause as he points out, they just going to go spend it and right. guess where it's going to be spent the top five to 10 companies. Mm-hmm. And so it's a more matter of like, can we fix the education system? Can we actually give the skills required to be in a robotics atmosphere so that when we do increase wa- wages, people actually have the skills to go get a higher paying job mm-hmm. and a higher skilled paying job. Like the, the education system is the fundamental breaking point here because we need to re-educate our entire working class to a completely different type of, of, of work and labor. Mm-hmm. To what specifically you're saying? More tech oriented or more uh, like um, trades? What will replace or either? What will or... replace manual labor, which is robotics, technology, etc. And you're like, well, then it was going to require a huge amount of compute power. Yeah, probably you need to go also figure out like 
drilling oils and like and figuring out like renewable energy and like mm. these are all things that will be spun up as a result of the extra compute power and energy required and like you know you got china over there just kicking butt on nuclear power and we're over here like spending 30 years trying to figure out one project it's like we've got to figure this out to be able to comp create the power required for the compute so that we can then generate all of this power required for the robotics that will then take our entry-level laborers but because they're now skilled they can go work on these other problems mm -hmm. and make more money mm -hmm. But just artificially moving things is usually a bad solution. Cause like, you're just not going to be like, oh yes, we're going to increase your wages. It's going to flow to the lower and your, your stock price is going to go down. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but you, Mr. Politician are not as smart as someone who's been in business for 30 or 40 years. You're just not like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. They're going to figure it out yeah, yeah. and they're going to cut labor <laughs> and they're going to get checkout lanes that don't have, have, have employees. They're going to get robotics to be able to stock the shelves and clean the floors. Mm -hmm. They're just going to do it. Yeah. And so, it would, it would just lead to more inflation and then making the lower class basically unemployable. Mm -hmm. So theorize with me for a minute. Say 100 years. Yeah. Okay, two different Americas. Because th that's why I'm saying 100 years because everyone who listens to this will be dead by then, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so that way no one can hold you accountable for this uh, if it's a bad take. America, <laughs> America continues on its current path. America goes maybe the Scott Galloway path. Okay. Uh, more progressive tax structures, higher taxes on corporations, increase to social programs, and um, minimum wage across the board. In 100 years, current path versus Scott's path. Well, what was going to happen? What's going to happen? Either way, it's going to the rich will get richer, the poor <laughs> will get poorer, and eventually you have an overhaul of a dynasty because that that difference gets so great. Mm. And so that's when you have civil wars. That's when you have a uh, toppling of power. And um, then things have to get reset. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then 100 years, I won't care about it. Yeah. So in the in the meantime, I'm just going to make sure I'm in the top echelon and yeah. just go for that. <laughs> just keep making money. <laughs> keep making money. So your problems are how do I get around the tax code, not how do I put food on the table? And that yeah. sounds harsh. Like that, yeah. someone could clip that and that's like, wow, this guy is horrible. Like so what a corporate <laughs> shill. Like so unrelatable. It's like, no, I'm literally, I'm literally middle class. I like, can't play. <laughs> I cannot change the rules of the game. Yeah, so exactly. I will play them to the full extent possible. 100%. All righty. Last thing I wanted to talk to you about. I think this is one of the most hilarious first lines of an article of all time. By the way, Brian put a comment in the last video. Did you see it? It was uh, really good, oh, I yeah. thought. Brian Tax, Rand, yes. Taxing yes, yes. doing capital gains if you leveraged it. I like yes, that idea. I like that. Yes, That's a really that good. good idea. Yeah. There were a few comments uh, that were good. Some were kind of out oh, there. I, I only so saw the fine. first little couple. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, Brian's was great. Uh, <laughs> that was a good idea, I yeah. thought, though. Yeah. I think that's like a decent compromise. Like, look, if you leverage it, like if you're going to use it as collateral, mm -hmm. it's now being utilized. Right. Therefore, you should tax that. Right. Whereas like, if you're just having a piece of real estate or stock and they're just gaining equity, great. But if I'm going to take a home equity line of credit, well, now I'm utilizing the equity. Mm -hmm. So then shouldn't I be taxed on that as a gain? Mm -hmm. I like that idea. I like it for certain levels of, I guess, income. Yeah. Because, like, your average American, like, should they be taxed aggressively on a HELOC if they're going to, like, redo their roof? You know, like, that's a need for their house. Mm -hmm. You're saying now we should tax the equity when they get secure that HELOC. I don't know if I agree with that all the way down to that level of, like, like a homeowner needs $20,000 to redo their roof. They need a HELOC. Now mm -hmm. you're saying, well, we need to tax you on the equity that you're using well, as Well, yeah, you, you, we do what we do in this country all the I time, which is do layers. Yeah, and all I'm, the just saying, I just, I'm just saying. I just think it's a good concept. <laughs> it I, is, it Especially is. for the rich, like, because yes. that's how they get around everything. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was a good concept. Yeah. I'm sure there's holes in it I haven't thought of, but I just saw the comments like, that was, that good. was good. I think I just felt like valid. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did. It was fantastic. <laughs> all righty. This is a hilarious first line from NBC News. Chase Bank is urging its customers not to commit check fraud. What? Did you hear about this? No. Oh, you did not hear about this. Okay, let's go. <laughs> I checked out of the news. The Sorry. bank's plea comes after this weekend. A viral trend took over TikTok and X, with users being told that there was a system wide glitch and that if they deposited false checks in an ATM and withdrew the money soon after, they would be able to cheat the system and take out a large sum of cash before the check bounced. <laughs> the only problem is that it's not a glitch, it's a check fraud scream, and those who participate will be on the hook for all the money they withdrew once the check bounces. 
Although oh some on TikTok called this scheme a glitch, <laughs> Chase reminded his customers that this glitch is actually an invitation to commit fraud. <laughs> <laughs> we are aware of this incident and it has been dressed, a spokesperson from Chase said in a statement to NBC News. Regardless of what you see online, depositing a fraudulent check and withdrawing the funds from your account is fraud, plain and simple. So this was going around X. I saw I saw a clip on X yeah. of like this guy going to a Chase ATM, like puts in a fake check, withdraws, and then like has just a stack of hundreds, twenties, <laughs> whatever. And they're like, yo, you can do the glitch of the system. Da, da, da. And then you see hours later, people posting like their bank account and it's like negative $10,000. <laughs> so I didn't know if you saw that or heard about it, but uh, it wasn't, act I thought it was going to be news because a lot of people were saying it was a glitch in the system. And they're like, no, like we just assume that it's a legitimate check until we can verify it then you withdrew against a fraudulent check, which means you're on the hook. Yeah, well, so most banks will hold the check, and and then mm -hmm. and then that that isn't possible. Sometimes, like certain credit unions, or if you have if you have a bank account at the mm -hmm. bank, like part of their service is like, hey, we will basically take your word that you have mm -hmm. the money. But it's actually pretty hard to do that because most banks will hold the check mm -hmm. uh, on one end or the other, either mm -hmm. your receiving check or your or your the, the bank that you are uh, pulling from. This is the funny thing. This is where like the crypto blo bros are like blockchain, because you could never do that on the blockchain, because it would be like immediate. Yeah. You know, you know whether or not their wallet had that. But then much. you ask them to explain blockchain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like yeah. I can't even fully explain it. I yeah. don't. <laughs> it's a ledger, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the, it wasn't a glitch. I, I just didn't. I thought I didn't know if there was going to be more to that or if you saw anything about it. But basically, a bunch of people committed check fraud. Nice. Didn't realize they were committing check fraud and were pulling out. What do they think was going to happen? They're just going to get free money. Well, it's the internet. It's TikTok. It's X. So weird. People were like, "There's a glitch in the system." Yeah, they're just going to give us all money. This is great. Just go to an ATM, pull money out. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but uh, that that is that. Don't commit check fraud. Let's go. That's, that's it, it. Sounds too easy. It is. It is false. <laughs> all right. Any non financial advice for the people? Oh, dude, I'll just read you one of the things I've been musing about. Perfect. One of my recent learnings. Here, you go first, though. Go ahead. You know, I don't, I don't really you don't have anything. I don't really have anything today, so I don't want to. Okay, I'll just read this. It's like a, it's like four sentences, five sentences. Okay, so um, these are just amusing to myself. I usually don't share these. So this is, uh, you'll be judged for reacting too fast if things don't pan out as good or as bad as thought. Overreaction creates massive damage. You will be, da you will be also judged for reacting too slow if the threat ends up being valid. They will say you didn't move fast enough. Adjust speed of reaction accordingly. Basically, it's like, I've just looked at, like over the past six months, I've slowed down my reaction time mm -hmm. to anything like massively, good or bad. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I did that is because I, I realized that overreacting will cause twice as much damage as just moving too slow. Like mm -hmm. there is damage caused by moving too slow. Yes. But it is, it is far lower than going too fast. Mm -hmm. And great analogy if you're skidding while driving on snow and ice. If you overreact, you're going to lose control. Mm -hmm. They teach you to like small yeah. reactions if your car starts to skid. Yeah. So. Um, and I think that's a good analogy because like it's not a matter of necessarily always speed. It's also a matter of like how much, mm -hmm. right? So that's a good analogy. Um, the reason I did it like eight months ago, nine months ago, I had a couple things that I did too quickly in terms of changes in the businesses mm -hmm. and um, caused big problems. Also, um, I looked at all the people that I saw as being successful in terms of founders and almost all of them, I personally was thinking they move too slowly. And then it's like, well, the results should speak for themselves. And I was like, the person that is more calculated goes to every single decision with data instead of reacting mm -hmm. to it is usually what makes the right decision. And the right decision is the thing that causes the success, not the reaction speed. Right. And so, um, you know, I just started going through all these founders and I always like, there were certain times I'm like, okay, like, whether it be Elon, like I could list off probably about five or 10 that I've, I've very much carefully analyzed like how quickly they respond to certain things mm. that were bad um, or good, really, really good opportunities. And they're all really, really slow. Mm. And so to me, so I'm like, well, that's more of an indication that I'm at wrong. I'm probably like, there's a, there's a range here. I probably am too far on the, the fast side. Mm -hmm. So like artificially I've been moving myself towards the slower side. Nice. Um, so, but, but then you're judged the all opposite way, which I've never been judged that way before. I've mm -hmm. always been like, he's fast, he's great. He's like, cause in the, but then there's like massive downside consequences of making yeah. the bad decision. And I think the more calculated approach is like what I'm learning is as a whole, the best thing for the company usually. Yeah. 
I this, in the seven years I've worked with you, you've never been accused of moving slow, right? To my knowledge, uh, there's two ca- cases I could bring up. Okay, <laughs> so I, I would assume with probably letting people go. That's, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. That one I'm fast on. All right, fair enough. It's more like it's more like business decisions. Like so, for example, I, I'll bring up one that was I wasn't thinking of. Okay, um, because it hasn't happened. Um, uh, something we brought up with the Francis uh, Advisory Council, mm-hmm. and basically. That might happen in like a year or two. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And it's going to go through like tons of iterations and testings. It was a complete like idea. Mm-hmm. It's like, I always want your initial response. In the past, I would be like, okay, thank you for your feedback. I'm rolling this out and we're going to test this here. Yeah. And then I, I would like start yeah. testing stuff way sooner. Uh, and now it's like that, if that happens, which the likelihood of it happens is like 10%, 20%. But if it happens, it'll probably be the course of the next 12 to 36 months that that actually ha- it occurs. Mm-hmm. Um, like the damages in 2024 that I made on moving too quickly will like haunt me for the next two to two to three years. Yeah. Like the decisions I made that were yeah. way too quick, made way too many changes to things. And so like, I'll just slow down and uh, that will make some people mad because they fell in love with like the previous version. Right. But like, I just consistently see like, for example, all right, Elon was four years late on delivering the cyber truck, four years late. Mm-hmm. People gave him money. Yeah. Four years ago right. on a truck. It became like a bit on like social media to be like, oh, it's still waiting. With you like know how much pressure was on him to yeah. like push that out faster? Yeah. And he's like, no, like we're going to keep, we're going to focus on other stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I promise. Hey, that's a deadline. Like what do what you do? Like we're going to keep doing this other stuff. Oh yeah, COVID happens. Like we're not even thinking about the cyber truck right now. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, you promised this. Like there's so much pressure. He could have pushed out something. They had the, the, the they could have pushed out something. Mm-hmm. Right, so um, that's just one example. I, I have I've like yeah. last year I researched like ten, and then yeah. I was like, "All right, I'm putting the brakes on, dude. Nice. This is ridiculous." I like it. So, yeah. but there are some things you go really <laughs> fast on firing. No, thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. That one still <laughs> continues to be fast on. But well, and the, I believe I don't think Jocko Willink coined this, but I do think it's a Navy SEAL or special ops term. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. really it. Slow yeah. is smooth, smooth is fast. Yeah, I think it'll take me a little while to get both of those down, though. It, it's a yeah. It's a, it's a balancing act. Yeah. Like the, the, the slow part, you can, you can be slow and get nothing done. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> right? So I, I'm slow working on Slow like, while acting yeah. is smooth. Yeah, so I have a few things I'm doing. <laughs> I think it'll take me like 12 months to kind of get where I want. Um, you've seen some of the stuff like yesterday yeah. and stuff yeah. I'm trying to put in place. So anyways, cool. it's fun. Love it. Awesome. You have no financial advice, bro? Ah, I'm out here stalling for you. No, no, no. I don't, I'm good. <laughs> You're good. I, you know, I don't want to give people advice if All I don't right. feel it's warranted. Okay. All That's right. there's my advice. There you go. <laughs> don't don't give advice if you don't feel it's warranted. Non-financial. Sometimes not giving advice is best. There you go. All Just right. Just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> okay. I like it. <laughs> like and subscribe.